Hello everyone, welcome to another session for our ARD and part exam. Uh, my name is Hansa Nora and I've been your mentor for your ARD session. So for today we're going to continue with our fisheries which is part 3. And please don't forget to subscribe and as well as press the bell icon for further notifications. And if you've liked the video, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button as well and share it with your friends. Right, so first and foremost, what we need to know is we're going to start off with what are fish ponds. So fish ponds, these are basically just an artificial or it can be man-made ponds where we rear the fishes. It's actually um, interlocked in all sides and these are can be natural as well as these can be um, in a man-made. So man-made, we can aware it can be in the form of a tank or through mud or uh, any of that sort. So these are fish ponds, right? So let's go to what the types of fish pond. Basically, there are five types of fish ponds. The first one is hatching pits. Second one is spawning ponds. Third is nursery ponds. Uh, fifth is rearing ponds and fifth is the growing ponds or uh, it's also known as the stocking ponds. Right, so let's go in detail with each and every pond uh, of these types. The first and foremost is the hatching ponds. So hatching ponds, these are basically uh, made of small tanks as well as can be also made of um, of a cloth as well. Right, so these tanks are used for hatching of the fertilized eggs of these uh, fishes and we provide a continuous uh, the main pro main thing here is that we provide a continuous flow of water which helps in aeration and which will in turn give them a proper oxidation all right so they won't be in stagnant water and since there's going to be continuous flow aeration also will be great and in turn it is going to help in the fertilized fertilization of the eggs so these uh these are also this uh, we can also know Tell them that these are the smallest ponds. They are usually in the size of about uh, 2.5 into 1.5 into 0.6 mm -hmm. meters. So this is the basic area or dimension for this uh, pond. It can be in a form like uh, suppose this is in a circular way, and this is also this is known as the hopper. It's hoppers. So let me just explain to you what hoppers are. The hoppers are basically a uh, are hatching ponds which are made of cloth. So these are the same thing like the here it's made of the concrete cement and here it's made of cloth. So this can be made of a coarse cloth or or it can be also made from uh, from a mosquito net, right? So and these are in a, a dimension of about two into one point five and zero point five meter. So these these are some of the things on the hatching ponds. Right? So these are known as the hopper. So in this picture, I've just given it's a typical uh, Chinese uh, of hatching pond. So let me just write it here. Right. So these are the things on the uh, hatching ponds. So moving further, we're gonna go to uh, the spawning. So the spawning ponds. These are uh, a pond where we where we use it for spawning. And the small pond, uh, it's actually a bit bigger than the hatching ponds but uh, smaller than other ponds, right? So these are of an average or very medium size in small size. So these are the ponds which where the uh, brood fishes are placed for spawning. And the brood fishes, they can be called as in hoppers for spawning as well. So even in the same way, uh, for hatching, as we use the hoppers for hatching, even here we can use this for our spawning, right? <coughs> And let's go to our next pond, which is a nursery pond. Nursery pond, these are larger than the uh, spawning ponds. And they have the, these are mostly used for the newly hatched fry. So this type of, uh, these are the nursery ponds. These are the type of ponds which are bigger than the hatching ponds, but uh, hatching ponds as well as the spawning ponds. But these are uh, mostly, uh, these are, used for these newly hatched fry. So basically, uh, what are the fries? So uh, if you can come across the word, the term fry here, a fry is nothing but a development stage. Of fish, which is right 
after the love uh, after the larval stage which is less than a week so this is basically the stage of a fish where the which uh, which is right after the larval stage and at which can be right after a week right so these are usually in a uh, these are usually in uh, area or a dimension of 15 into 15, 15 into 15 into 1.2 meter and seasonal which dries up during the summer so usually it's seasonal it means that the they do not uh, we do not give water continuously there's no continuous flow of water since it's seasonal as due to evaporation during the and due to hot summers during this uh, summer it usually dries up and during winters it usually stays so these are the types these are something about this nursery ponds so let's move on to our rearing ponds our rearing ponds these are a larger ponds which is in a dimension or a size of about 3 30 into 10 into 1.25 meter and um, these are used for rearing advanced fry till they grow into finger limbs so advanced fry would be like a more than this a larval stage but uh, till the period of a fingerlings. So a fingerling can be defined as a developmental stage of a fish where the fing uh, of a fish following the fry stage, which is right after the fry stage, and it continues to uh, the first three or the four months of life. So from the fry stage, which will be uh, which will be more than uh, which will be a uh, age which is less than a week till the duration of three to four months would be this fingerling stage right i hope that's clear right and here uh, these uh rearing pond they may be seasonal as well as they may be perennial it means the seasonal it can either dry up uh, during the summers or it can be season uh, or it can be just during the winters or it can be perennial which will go on for the whole of the year and it has a gentle slope to facilitate netting of the fingerlings right so these are some of the features and points on the rearing ponds so here in this picture, I've just given you, uh, it's actually near the slope area or there's a slight slope in the pond where it can facilitate the easy access for catching of these fingerlings. So fairly, it's a, it's a larger uh, it's a larger pond and which can be seasonal as well as perennial. Right, so the third, last one here is on the growing ponds or the stocking ponds. So these growing or the stocking ponds, these are large parallel ponds, which is more than two meters deep and is used for the growth of the fish to marketable size. The size of the fish pond depends on what kind of species, species you're cultured as uh, some species can be really small, some can be really big and uh, even their physiological uh, properties of the fishes also differs from each and every species right so in that way we have to facilitate with we have to know whether we're going to go for or whether we'll be needing a larger pond or a deeper pond or a smaller pond in comparison to uh, the other ponds so um in addition to this in addition this two to three marketing ponds are also constructed in fish farms these are used for stocking fish ready to the market so uh, besides that the growing pond or the uh, we construct it's a stocking ponds as well, uh, which can be uh, ready for the market right after the harvest. We could just keep it there and so that we can, from there, we can just take it, transport it, or lodge it, and then we could give it for the market. So these ponds, these are arranged uh, in two or more parallel rows uh, with a spacing of 1.25 spacing separated them. So basically, it can, it's a uh, rowing pond or the stocking pond. These are, can be man-made most of the time, right? And uh, these are actually placed in a row like next to each other and the spacing is usually about 1.25 so these are basically a large perennial pond these are the points that you need to remember here so here in this uh, picture I've just given uh, uh, I don't know whether it's visible for you all to see the another adjust adjacent uh, fish pond from here so the same way these are perennial ponds which are placed in rows of with different other rearing or the stocking ponds right so these are fairly the largest ponds if you compare it to the um, other fish ponds so i hope this is clear about the fish ponds and so let, now let's go to the management of the fish seeds Man fish seeds would be so fish seeds as we have for the plants as well that we need the seeds to grow something out of it 
So here, fish seeds, it's collected them, which means uh, fertilized fish eggs. So let's go, uh, the, the, they are usually in the flow of the collection of seeds. And we'll be going for breeding and then we'll collect the eggs and then we're going to collect the spawns. So uh, these are just uh, some of the steps in the management of the fish seeds. So let's go in detail with each of this. So management of the fish seeds, the collection of fish seeds. Uh, the first one here is uh, that in India, we are we usually do it in from two sources. The first one here is in the fish uh, seed, water fish seed resources. And the second one is marine uh, fish seed resources. For water, uh, for fresh water, river system, river system. And the third one here is in this in this the Indus River system. Fourth is the East Coast River system, and the fifth is the West Coast River system. Right. So these are some of the examples for the fresh water seed resources. But now let's move move on to the marine seed fish seed resources. We have marine basically in the marine it uh, it mostly from the ocean or the sea or in the coastline so it stretches the stretch is about 8100 kilometer along the coastline between your resources or the collection is uh, it means that it'll, from there only you'll be getting able to collect the fish seeds in the marine fish seed resources right so these are about the collection of the fish seed resources so let's go back to the management of the fish sheets after collecting the fish seeds from these uh, resources, we're going to go and we're going to rear them and after that we're going to breed the species. So after breeding, breeding is basically just um, artificial uh, artificial fertilization of the two species or the two plant or the two uh, organisms. It can be natural as well as can be artificial. So once we breed them, after they fertilize the eggs, we're going to collect the fertilized eggs again and then from there we're going to collect the spawns right so and you can preserve the spawns for the future for the use right so these are some of these are the steps following the management of the fish seeds so let's move on to the fish pond management so there are two mainly two techniques which are involved in the fish pond management right so the first one here is the manipulation of the pond ecology to ensure optimum production of natural food fish while maintaining the water quality parameters within tolerance limit of the stock fish species. Right, so we have another one, the husbandry of fish through stock manipulation, supplementary feeding and health care. So these are the basic two important techniques or the steps that you need to follow for the fish pond management. So here is the manipulation of the pond ecology. So basically, uh, when we, uh, in the same way as, as plants, it's also uh, there we need the proper management practices for uh, sustaining the uh, fish pond, right? So for that, there are, there will be times when there will be uh, differences in the pH level, in the, in the basicity or the acidity of the, uh, of the fish pond, as well as we have to supplement them with various uh, fertilizers and manuring as well in the, uh, in the, uh, in the water, so that for the proper sustaining and the proper functioning of the fishes. So manipulation, we need to manipulate the pond ecology in order that we'll be getting a maximum or highest production or the maximum profit from the fish, from the fish rearing and the fish pond. Right. So these are some of the techniques that we need, uh, which is mandatory and which we need for the management practices. As well as like even uh, we need to give a supplementary feed as well along with the natural feed that they'll be eating. So we'll be giving them an extra feed or a supplementary feed and stock manipulation as well as a health care. So health care is a very important uh, thing for because even the fishes can uh, <clears throat> get a, lot, a couple of diseases and uh, diseases and sickness. So for that, we need a proper care, health care system for these fish pond. Right, so here now we're going to talk something on the fish pre-stocking pond management. So pre-stocking pond management also has a five steps or the five techniques where we need for the stock management so what is a pre what is a pre-stocking pond management a pre-stocking uh, pond management can be defined as or its management which means before the stocking which uh, management before the stocking of the fishes 
Broadly, it can be said that uh, it is the management practices involved in fish culture before the stocking of a fry. So what, before the stocking of a, a fry or before it attains an age or development age of about less than a week, before stocking up the fishes, the whole management system is known as the pre-stocking management, right? So in uh, we, we do it uh, so that in order to uh, prepare the water body and its surrounding environment uh, proper and uh, uh, a pro a proper and adaptable for the fishes to live and for the proper growth and function of these fishes, right? So, <clears throat> the basic, as I've said, the basic. Uh, there are five main. Uh, there are five main uh, stages or the five main techniques for this pre-stocking pond management. The first one is first and foremost, we need to prepare the pond. And the second here is eradicate the undesirable fishes or the aquatic species or the uh, predatory fishes. And then we go to lining of the pond. And after lining of the pond, we can fill the water. And then we can have basal manuring as well as fertilization of these ponds. So let us go in detail with each of this. First and foremost is the pond preparation. So again, pond preparation can be divided into four main categories or the four main techniques. The first one is pond drying or pond dewatering, and then we have a distilled or bottom mud evacuation uh, excavation. We have a dike and canal reconstruction. The last one is plowing or tilling of the bottom of the of the bottom of the uh, pond. So, what is this part, What is this uh, uh, pond drying or dewatering? So now we're going to go with our dewatering of the pond. So what is dewatering of the pond? The what dewatering of the pond, as the picture suggests here, you can see a picture of uh, a pond being uh, dewatered. It means that water is sucked out of the pond to make it dry. So these here, they allow the bottom, uh, the pond to dry up to the bottom level. And after we, uh, after we suck out the water from the pond, then we're going to keep it for sun drying right for at least about 15 days and these are why do we expose it to the sun it means uh, we will definitely kill the weeds as well as the other predatory or the fishes uh, unwanted fishes or insects and their eggs as well from the pond so the basic thing is the sun is a natural sterilizer for, uh, for to kill all the unwanted microbes from the soil so that's the main reason for it to dewater so we can go with it. Uh, we also have the mineralization of the organic matter takes place. And the poisonous gases, they also escape through the watering of the pond. And we can removal of the silt and repair of the environment. So these are some of the points why we do a dewatering of the pond, right? And the second step here is desilting of the bottom mud evacuation. So this after dewatering the pond, uh, the excess mud is taken out from the bottom of the pond. Right, and after drying it for, after drying the pond, generally about ten to twelve centimeter of the land, or, or or of the mud is taken out, which is a very laborious, physical laborious, uh, job to do, and it is a desilting process. Uh, it is actually it actually removes the unwanted or the bottom mud, or which are actually rich in nutrients without inf interference in the next cropping system. So the removal materials that have been uh, taken away from the ponds, they are not spread over the dike or the buns uh, so that they are not washed back into the pond system again. So this actually uh, helps in the, uh, the after you uh, dewater it, the leveling of the bottom should be also done. So which will allow the effective rotting and the harvesting of the um, fishes, right? So these are some of the points on the desilting or the bottom mud evaporation. And let's go to our dike and canal construction. So uh, uh, if you're wondering what a dike is, a, a dike is a naturally a wall which we built. A, um, suppose this is a pond. So a, uh, a high wall is built. So it's actually uh, done uh, for following like a couple of reasons to, uh, to prevent the pond from overflowing during the rainy season as well. And it also is, uh, it's also done to prevent the breaking of the dike and uh, as well as uh, to give a certain shape and structure to the pond and as well as it also maintains the slope of the pond which is necessary right so <clears throat> these are some of the objectives or the main things that why we go for a dike and a canal construction okay the first 
these the broken pond dike it must be repaired and it must be well raised to prevent the out, uh, outward migration so remember it also helps in the preventing of the outward migration of the fish right and as well as the flooding control so grass or other vegetables can also be planted on the dikes which would allow prevent erosion on the dike and monsoon moves and elevate turbidity problem as well so basically if you plant vegetables or any uh, uh, crops around the dike not only will it because of the root it will hold the soil more tighter and it'll be more compact so there will be less a chance of uh, the erosion as the soil will not be friable and it will be more compact so these are some of the reasons why we do this dike and canal construction the last uh, last technique we're going to come here is on the plowing or the tilling of the bottom so plowing or the tilling of the bottom is of the plowing or the tilling of the bottom is usually done uh, when the bottom silk soil detects a crack after removal of the bottom silk so uh, after right after removal it's going to crack so for that we're going to go, go about put a tilting or tilling or the plowing a plowing of the bottom soil right so it is at uh, done uh, at around five to eight centimeter uh, in done which is done diagonally two times and it is right for three to ten days right so these are some of the things on the plowing and tilling of the bottom Flowing on tilling of the bottom of the pond and these are some of the methods on the pond management and the, same, the second one here is eradication of the undesirable fishes and aquatic weed, weeds so the first one here is the control of the aquatic weed we have control of predators and undesirable species and we have eradication of the undesirable fish species so uh, First and foremost, we need to understand why is, what are these aquatic weeds, and then aquatic weeds are the weeds which are which grow wildly in the uh, pond, and which can be uh, detrimental and can have some a lot of effects on the fishes and the normal function of the pond as well. So, a clean and excess uh, aquatic weed-free pond is very essential. It is for the better production and productivity, right? So, um, all the aquatic vegetation, whether they can be uh, floating or submerged or completely immersed, they should be removed from the pond. It means that it should be completely clean, and they hamper the primary productivity by uh, they actually absorb all the nutrients from the ponds which are, have been given on the, which has been supplied for the, uh, for the water and the soil. And they hinder the normal penetration of sunlight and mind action. So, uh, a sunlight as, uh, as well as the proper oxygen level, oxygen aeration, and oxygen level, and the sunlight will also be hampered uh, where when there is uncontrolled aquatic weeds. So, we prefer a more of a simple, cleaner uh, fish ponds, which will help in the better production of the fishes. So, it is also necessary to ensure the entrance of the sufficient sunlight uh, as well as more natural food to produce more natural food and to increase the fish production right so these are some of the things on the control of the aquatic weeds and now let's move on to the predatory or undesirable weeds so in predatory and undesirable species the predators here what are predators first and foremost predators are the species which take uh, uh, which hunt or hunt on the prey as foods by hunting right so some of the uh, example of these uh, predatory fishes will be chital boa so these are examples of the predatory uh, fishes so basically they uh, uh, once if you don't remove them they will serve on uh, they will feed on the or prey on the fishes which we want to rear in that particular pond so it's very important, it's necessary to take out the predators so that they do not prey on the species that we want to raise. Right? And these um, some of the undesirable species can which are not are the species which are not actually expected in the pond during the culture of a specific or a desirable species. And they might grow naturally in the pond as well, uh, which cultured species as and these are known as the undesirable species or the wheat fishes right so these are some of the things and uh, the reasons uh, 
So the main reason is that at least a predator, they can eat about 10 to 12 kilos of other fishes for the 1 kg normal growth. So that's a, a, a lot to take in. Right? And some of the things can be like undesirable species, they also share the same food with the cultured species. So not only will they be compete will they be preying on these fishes, they will also be competing on the food for the same on the food as well. So they can also have uh, a breakout, they can also increase or induce the breakouts of the diseases for the cultured species, which is very for the cultured species. Right, so these are some of the things on the undesirable species, and now we can we're gonna go to our eradication of the undesirable fishes. So, uh, all the predatory and the unwanted fishes they must be eradicated from the pond prior to the stocking and fingerlings of the desirable species. Right, and they can also be done either by complete dewatering of the pond or poisoning. So it will, we'll, we're gonna go back back to that pond dewatering again. So once we dewater, then the water will be taken out, and in that, at that time we can also complete with the eradication of these undesirable fishes. So this is only possible through the dewatering of the pond, right? So other uh, commonly used efficient fish uh, tox uh, toxins can be retinol, tea seed, and we have tea seed oil, and we have mafua, oil cake. These are some of the efficient fish uh, the, uh, eradicating components which we uh, which can be used to eradicate these undesirable fishes. Right, so let's go to our third one, liming. What is liming? Liming is basically done to reduce the uh, acidity, higher acidity, or the higher acid to reduce the high acidity in the pond. So it will be uh, so that the uh, pond will or the water will be more basic or alkaline. So, this liming is uh, <clears throat> the main objective of the liming uh, is to maintain the pH and water, which will be above the six, and it can also increase the uh, function of the fertilizers as well as it can remove the turbidity of the water. So, uh, it, it also increases the uh, diseases and the toxic gases in the pond, and to make the uh, pond more environmentally clean. Right, and to increase their productivity. So this advantages is that the lime not only neutralizes the soil acidity and creates a buffer system to prevent the marked diurnal uh, fluctuation of the water from acid to alkaline conditions. Right, and they also destroy fish pathogens as well as intermediate, uh, inter intermediate fish stages. So, uh, and. They also settle excess dissolved organic matters and thereby they reduces the incidence of this uh, oxygen depletion and they also act as some detriments and an improved hygiene of the whole pond system. So apart from other advantages, these uh, the buffering actions or of the calcium is the the most important. So this line they serve both as prophylactic and therapeutic purposes and these line treatment of the this one uh, should be actually done before the initial manuring. So before the uh, manuring process, we need to follow this liming system. All right. So um, I hope that's clear about this uh, liming. So it neutralizes the soil acidity. It increases the pH value and changes the soil structure, and it improves the bacterial breakdown of organic and basically decrease the uh, outbreak and improves the hygiene of the pond. It also supplies calcium, which is a very, uh, which is a very needful uh, component or the mineral for the plant growth and the bone formation of the fishes, and also also to serve as a fertilizer and it has increased the productivity. So, <clears throat> so generally, this quick line is more effective than this snake line, right? So these are some of the points on the lining methods and these importance and why we do go for this lining. Right. So now we're gonna go for the fourth one which is water filling after liming is done we're definitely going to go for the water filling so when the one of the pond is fully prepared for stocking of the fish then the water filling is done i think this is self-explanatory and after one to two weeks of manuring the fertilizers the water depth has to be raised to the required level before stocking fish or the fish culture so uh, manuring and fertilizers these are here the zooplankton and the phytoplankton these are the main natural food fish so the main objective of this Fertilizing is to produce a natural food 
as well as to increase the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, etc. So manuring and fertilizers are also one of the basic main objectives and the main techniques that we need to remember when we do for a pre-stocking problem. So the main objective, um, the types, it can be of um, organic manure as well as an inorganic fertilizers. So organic manures can be, uh, these are mostly done for to induce or to help the development of the natural food. And for the pond culture, a, a cow dung is used. So an FYM is actually used for as an organic manure for the pond, right? So even a, a poultry manure can also be used uh, instead of a cow dung. So if we're inorganic, we use uh, mostly generally urea, right? And <clears throat> so basically, uh, <clears throat> so organic manuring is an actually very important as a means of uh, adding the nutrients in the water as it helps in the soil texture as well. So if there, uh, there's more organic uh, manuring and there's gonna be a, butter com a better compactness and then there's gonna be a better soil structure as well. So uh, even if the soil is very loose or if it's sandy or so uh, sandy, then if you put an organic manure, it can, it can at least hold the water cooling faster and it can make the uh, sand or the soil very structured and compact. So the uh, usually it's mostly the manuring is mostly done in the morning from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock uh, so and the best way to apply these uh, dissolve uh, to apply is to dissolve the uh, fertilizers in water and it just spray throughout the four point surfaces so that's one of the um, uh, some of the those uh, some of the methods and the ways to uh, apply the manures and uh, so the daily manuring with about an uh, optimum small quantity has been found very um, very productive or found best for the optimum level for the fish production for fish production right so for example like uh, the best utilized uh, manure is from when the animals these are released together with the fish uh, under the integrated life stock come fish culture system so these can be a really good uh, this system integrated system is actually really good for using for improving the um, manuring and fertilizing of the fish ponds so these are about the these are something about manuring and manuring and fertilizing of the fish ponds so these are some of the parameters and suppose if it's green, if the water is green and blue, then it is due to the predominance of the phytoplankton. If, the, uh, if it's rich in brown, if it's brown in color, it's actually rich in zooplankton, which is very ideal for the fish culture. And if it's dirty, then there is a cell suspension in the water. And to correct this, we just add a little bit of lime mixture. And if it's clear or the turbid is less productive, then we add additional manuring to correct it. If the pH is about 7.5 to 9, it means if it's more of a alkaline or the basic, it's considered highly productive for the fish culture. So liming is a method that we use because it makes the whole uh, pond or it makes the water more into the alkaline side, right? So basically in acid soil, acid water is actually not preferable for the culturing of the fishes. These are something about the uh, thing and we have an estimation. <coughs> so now let's go to uh, the feed. So a feed can be defined as a food fish, right? So it can be, there are different types of feeds. For example, here I've just uh, given some of the examples. It can be a grosses, your pulses and legumes, uh, right? And we have miscellaneous fodder crops as well. We have cereals. Uh, cereals, rice, uh, wheat, bran, bar bajra, barley, all of that will be your cereals, oil bearing seeds like mahua, neem oil, yeah, sunflower, all of that uh, will come under your sesame uh, oil and seed cakes. We have additives, fish additives, we have root crops, animal products, right? So, and animal products as well as fruits and vegetables, and some miscellaneous. So these are some of the food or the feed additives that feeds that are 
are usually done for, given for the plants for the fishes so also in the artificial different there are like artificial feeding can be of the mustard oil cake moc or a rice bran as well which is given the ratio of one is to one ratio as per two to three percent per kg body weight of a fish per day right so and we have a stocking density right so a stocking density for a spawn is usually eight, around 100 lakhs one four or ten million per hectare for 15 days <coughs> and for fry we have a 10 likes 1 million per hectare for two to three months fingerling these are the so basically these are the rates stocking rates or the stocking density all right and then finger lengths we have about 10,000 per hectare per year so these are some of the important points that you need to remember right you can maybe take a screenshot of these all right so now we're going to go to our last topic which is the post harvest technology Post harvest technology is a very important factor in uh, in every aspect of agriculture because that's the last uh, last thing. And then even if all the production technology is done correctly, if the post harvest technology is not done right, then there is no point of the then the whole then the whole effort on the production is going to go waste. Eventually, if the production technology is not proper, then uh, you won't be able to deliver it to the market as well as to the door as well as to the consumers. So this actually affects the high in the uh, in the marketing as well as in the profit of these whole industries and it can cause a major loss in the production system so the, what is post harvest fisheries they uh, culminate the, all the steps processes or activities immediately after catching handling and transportation processing distribution of the fish and fishery products where it controls not applied post harvest losses will occur. So the processes such as handling, transportation, processing, distribution, and of this fishery product and the fishes, these are these come under your post harvest technology. Let's go in detail with all of these. So why is post harvest important? So it is important uh, to and uh, as it helps in the handling of the fishes and the processing of the fishes in terms of quality, uh, better shelf life and product range, as well as it also increases like to increase the economic activity and the employment. Even if the people are not engaged in the actual production or the uh, rearing of the fishes, and another way of earning an income or earning giving an employment to the people is through this processing in the post harvest technology right so it is all not only will it help in, in increasing their income it's going to help in the stand, increasing standard of living as well as going to help in the economy of the country there's also a way of stabilizing the fish marketing by providing an outlet for surplus right so these are some of the important points and it can also contribute to the effort in the nutritional goals the first one is here is handling the quality of the fish they depend on how it's handled from the time it's taken out of the water till it reaches the kitchen this is basically the definition of a handling and first step of the post harvest technology that we have to handle from the whole process of taking out the fishes from the harvested area till it reaches the kitchen uh, till it reaches the consumer the whole process is called as the post harvest handling or the post harvest handling methods right so these can be your tra can also and after that we're going to go to the transportation and transportation and the fresh fish supported transported the distance a transportation basically is once you get the uh, once you get the once, once you get the product from the harvested area the tra we have to transport it to certain parts of the country to certain area so this whole process of transportation can uh, be very crucial because uh, we, we need a proper uh, storage or infrastructure during the transportation or how it is transported through boats or through trucks or in what way they're transported these are very important and to what level they can be transported by road or via anything of the sources right and this transportation this the uh the fresh the fish transported to far distance they must be uh more taken care more of it because there are higher chances of it rotting so to ensure that we need to pack it with the eyes uh, to ensure the freshness when they reach the consumers so that's why a lot of times when you see fishes we it's all usually packed in an ice so proper packing of its fresh fish is very important and it means um arranging the fish properly along with the eyes in alternately in between 
uh, that is a, with a proper chilling temperature. So to attain a ratio of one kg of ice, uh, so if you're gonna compare, a one kilo of ice is needed for two kilo of fish. So that's the proper ratio of the uh, mixing of the ice and the fish, right? And the most sophisticated or the most uh, met, like used in a lot of developed countries, these are used uh, in the refrigerated truck or the insulated vans. So, so, so these are very getting very common in a lot of countries now, and a lot of countries are actually using it, almost all of it. And so, but when the transporting fish within the region, uh, whole takers pack them in ice, and upon reaching the destination, the fishes they are repacked with ice and they are sold to the cons consumers. So processing and value addition. So processing and value addition is a very important step in the fish and uh, fish production and the fish uh, post harvest technology as uh, usually a fish they usually spoil within 12 hours so a proper processing to increase this shelf life and adding a value value to the fish is very important in the market because that's gonna uh, this whole thing revolves around this processing and addition of the value value addition of these uh, thing so for that we need to understand what are the things that, that can be done, right? So the first one here is the fish, they usually spoil within 12 hours and due to, it can also be regulated or it can also change due to high temperature, which is, uh, if it's a, if there's a high temperature, there's going to be bacterial growth. So it's important to put the ice in the, um, uh, while processing the fishes. And to prevent contamination of these fishes, uh, proper hygiene also must be uh, ensured because on the way, during the way of transportation, anything can, might have happened. And to contain it from all the diseases and all the bacterial growth and fungal growth, we need to, uh, uh, you need to take precautionary measures to take, do you need to take precautionary measures for the proper hygiene of these fishes, right? And then, <clears throat> and the contamination they can also come from people from the dust sewage water manure or spoiled foods as well and it can spread spread out right and so a pretty clean equipment domestic animals pets vermin or unhygienic slaughtered animals can also be the cause as well uh, so it's very important or uh, where you keep the process or the clean uh, fit of all of these fishes so the storage is also very important uh, so that it does not get um, uh, it does not get infected or it does not get in touch with any of these unhygienic things and products and these so basically they prevent the spoilage they actually spoil the whole harvest of the fish and so in India at least about 67 so in India about at least <coughs> about at least 67 percent of the total fish production is consumed uh, in a uh, consumed in a fresh form and another 23 percent is consumed in a processed or a preserved way so some of the methods so some of the methods that we use in the processing or that we use in the process that we use in the processing on adding the value to suppress the uh, bacterial growth or uh, can be your salting drying smoking fermenting cooling freezing so salting so a uh, salting which is a natural uh, which is uh, one uh, sugar and salt as you all know these are natural preservators so salting salt can be used as a natural preservative mm -hmm. right and we have a dry we have drying as well so drying which is basically uh, just uh, it can be sun dried or it can be artificially dried where we just so dry the fishes in the sun, all right, um, maybe for 12 hours, and then after that, in an artificial dry, it can be air dried as well. So, these also can prevent the bacterial growth. Smoky, smoking is uh, when you actually when you take the fresh thing and when you put it over the um, when you put it over the fire, so that can it can actually go for days. So, the resultant will be your smoked fish. Right, and we have fermentation. Fermentation is also another method, and cooling or free freezing, as you all know, keeping the ice at a chill temperature can also help in uh, suppressing as a higher ambient temperature is needed for bacterial growth. And canning, canning here another example for canning would be your uh, tin fishes. 
that you get in the market, which uh, and where they preserve these uh, pre-cooked fishes and they keep it in the, the can. All right, and, and other preservatives or oil can be used here. So these are some of the methods to preserve the thing, to preserve the soil. So another uh, important thing is infrastructure. So infrastructure is really important where you storage. Storage infrastructure is very important where you're keeping your uh, fishes because it's important to keep in a very airtight conditions where a normal um, so that it can prevent all the so that it can take away all the congenial environments for the um, for the normal or harboring of these uh, diseases and all these microbes and so that it can avoid it can avoid the you can you can avoid the infection and the microbial growth on the fishes so that it will increase the shelf life so the main thing can be here is there it's the storage facilities the ice plants cold chains roads and transportation will all come under your infrastructure right so um, so the world they these would ensure a very high profit margins to the producers enabling faster fisheries and aquaculture development right and and these are uh, an effective marketing system is identified as uh, identified in aquaculture areas as the key requirement for the development of the sector and uh, this would also help in the ensure high profit margins to producers right so these are some of the things on infrastructure and let's go to our last domestic marketing and marketing is also very important the fisherman is a primary produce, producer should be paid by numerative prices on one hand to make the fish products available to the consumers at a reasonable rate on the other hand so wholesale fish markets are very few and retailing and these are mostly disorganized right so so due to lack of the storage and the preservation facilities a bulk of inland catch is marketed in fresh conditions only <sighs> So uh, it can be only done in like a very sh transportation will also be hampered and it can't go to a larger distance because due to the fail, uh, we don't have a proper storage and preservation uh, facilities in India, right? So, so this wholesale come uh, retail markets are used in all of the consumption centers and overcrowding and unhygienic handling of the fishes these are also uh, you can see the very common sites in the market so these are some of the why these wholesale fish markets are very disorganized right so right so these are some of the things on the uh, domestic marketing now we're going to go to our export So fishery sector has been one of the major contributors. I think I've already talked on the export in the first. I've already talked on the export in the first chapter. So basically, this uh, fisher market they have a very major contributors to the foreign exchange. It has a high demand. India has also had a high demand as uh, India produces its third in the fisher production. And in recent years, there has been a diverse. Uh, So in recent years, there has been a diversification in exports of the items like food and squid, cuttlefish, and variety of the fishes from India as well. And these, um, uh, the Japan, they continue to be the major market and in the importing of around at least 45% of its food from India, right? So uh, the prospects, they actually lie in diversified of, uh, fishing products and the markets. Right, and this tuna and the cephalophod, it is tuna, tuna fish and the cephalophod, they have been identified as a potential export candidate. Um, and these, if the freshwater species such as these carps, they have a potential, especially in the West Asian countries. And uh, basically, this modernization of the processing facilities can be, uh, can be actually improved, and these can meet the international standards of the primary importance of the of the industry as well so uh, now we're going to go to uh, now we're going to go to our so basically uh,
So now we're going to go to our quality control. Quality control, it means to control the quality in a proper way and the hygiene. So here, what comes for the quality, the first and foremost thing is the hygiene and sanitation. So these two are the main conditions in which they harbor the fish handling centers. And uh, usually the in India, the hygiene and sanitation centers are very poor and the way they handle the fishes are also very poor and disorganized. So this is partly due to the inadequacy in the design and construction facilities and partly due to the poor maintenance. So the quality control degrades because of such things. Right? So these uh so that is why this quality control is very important because if it's not unhygienic, if it's sanitation is not good definitely your force harvest handling is gonna completely fail right so these are some of the things on the post harvest technology and that's all for the day well uh, please don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon for the notifications and we'll be meeting for the next sessions and and if you've liked the video please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button as well as you can share it with your friends who have is giving the exam thank you